replied. We'll move to question time. And it's Senator Dunian. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Wong. Late last year, Minister Plibersek justified granting nearly $10 million of taxpayers' money to the Environmental Defender's Office by saying it was to, quote, help poor little farmers and local groups saving threatened species. Given the EDO is now actively threatening, jeopardising and stopping a series of projects of critical importance to Australia, will Minister Wong not only admit that Ms Plibersek's excuses for the grant were wrong, but also quantify how many jobs and how much investment in Australia has been lost because of the activities of this Albanese government-funded organisation? Thank you, Senator Dunham. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Well, first, I, I would make the point, uh, and I'm not sure which matters Senator Dunham is referring to, that if decisions are made in relation to environmental legislation which have an effect on development, they are decisions made by a judicial authority. Uh, and what he seems to be suggesting is that we should avoid having the law of the land apply by making sure we don't fund people. Now, I, you know, I, 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 at, there are times I'm sure uh, I, I, I may not, others may not. Members of the of this Senate do not agree with actions the EDO takes, but uh, these are uh, this is a a, a body uh, that is uh, uh, provides legal advocacy. Uh, you know, we do believe in the system of the rule of law. We do believe. Uh, that, uh, country, uh, that individuals and entities have a right to be heard in our legal system, and this enables to do that. You know, I know those opposite want to shut down different voices. I know that's the approach you take, uh, uh, and I know that that you, you don't want. So we all remember the gag clauses, don't we? Uh, that NGOs were funded with. Uh, I know that, despite your talk about freedom of speech, actually. Uh, the institutions of the democracy, which include, include people taking legal action with which we don't agree, with which governments don't agree, uh, 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 are, are part of our system of democracy. Uh, Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Dunham. Just a point of order on relevance. My question was specifically how many jobs are being lost and how much economic activity is being destroyed because of their funded activist uh, organisation. Senator Dunham, that was part of your question, but you also had uh, quite a substantial lead into that question that went to the funding of the environmental Defender's Office, I believe the minister is being relevant. <clears throat> it's an interesting interjection because the, the point is, if there are decisions made in relation to development applications, they are made in accordance with the law. You know, these are made in accordance with the law. So, what, what are you saying, Senator, that we should somehow uh, make sure? But make sure that but the point is, this is uh, as in our democracy, we do have a system uh, in which. People can take action uh, in, in pursuing Thank you, of, Minister. Of the, the law, time for even if we don't expired. agree. Senator Dunham, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. The taxpayer-funded EDO is now running courses to teach activists how to become relevant persons under Nopsema's guidelines. Yeah. Minister, do you endorse the EDO engaging in claim farming and exploiting consultation loopholes to halt projects like the $16.5 billion Scarborough project and the $5.8 billion Barossa development? Minister Wong. I don't take the same view, and nor does the government take the same view as the EDO in relation to the resources sector. No, we don't. But unlike you, we don't feel a need to shut people down. Unlike you, we don't feel a need. We don't feel a need to. to we, we, we actually think that there is a legal system in place which ought to uh, protect the interests of all. Uh, if there are loopholes, as you assert, then they should be brought to the attention of, of the legislature and the executive. But essentially, your essentially your position is: we want to make sure that people we, with whom we don't agree don't have the capacity to take action. We simply don't have the same view as you do. It, we, this, we don't have the same view as you do about our judicial system and our legal system. Now we know uh, that those are opposite. Uh, my recollection is uh, are those opposite put gag clauses into various NGO funding um, arrangements. You know, you don't want you don't you want you want you don't want organisations saying what the government is doing is wrong. Thank you, Minister. Hey, that's time not for democracy. Has expired. Senator Dunham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, given the havoc that the EDO, your taxpayer-funded EDO, is wreaking on Australia's economy through green lawfare, will the government now do the right thing? and withdraw the nearly $10 million of taxpayers' money that it's providing to it. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Minister. 
Oh, th thank you, President. I would make the point in relation to EDO uh, legal actions that, in fact, despite the fact that you didn't want them funded, they launched countless actions against you. Uh, the now Deputy Leader of the Opposition, when Minister, was challenged by the EDO in relation to a coal mine in northwest New South Wales, a coal project in the Galilee Basin, uh, a gas project, the Narrabri gas project, land clearing near the Great Barrier Reef. I mean, people, people, I mean, well, Senator, Senator Birmingham. Yeah, what, what is the position that we, we have to make sure that we silence all voices with which we don't agree? That's the position you take. With which you, that, that's the position you take. We, we on this side have a regard for our democracy, a regard for. Uh, yes, we do. I, know, I, I like the. You know, we, we do. And actually, we don't feel a need uh, to uh, silence those voices with which we don't agree. I don't agree. I don't agree. Uh, with some of the actions the EDO has taken as a cabinet minister and as a member of the Labor Party, I don't. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Watt. I refer to the recent High Court rulings, which determined that successive Liberal and National Party immigration and citizenship laws were unconstitutional. Given that the High Court struck down Mr Dutton's failed immigration and citizenship laws, what has the Albanese government done to keep the community safe since those decisions? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, just a moment, Minister. I'll order on my left. Minister. Thank you, President. And for the second day in a row, it would appear that members of the opposition don't like their own record being pointed out to them. So, Senator Walsh, I thank you for your question. And unlike how those opposite operated while they were in government, on this side of the Senate, we think it's important to ensure laws that protect the community can actually operate. Because it's not tough talk that keeps Australians safe, it's tough laws that stand up in court. And we are leaving no stone unturned in our efforts to protect the community, and we haven't wasted a single day in doing so. The Australian Border Force and the Order. AFP have been working Order. hard to ensure community safety. The work they are doing is exceptional, and I, for one, if not the opposition, thank Minister them for Walt, their hard work. And Minister Watt, I've called the chamber to order on two or three occasions. That is what I expect, not for people to just ignore me and continue their very loud interjections. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And we continue our work to protect the Australian community. We've already introduced a range of steps, including ankle bracelets, increased monitoring and curfews. We've provided additional support to our agencies—$255 million in total in extra support for these measures. We've made it clear from the outset that we would consider all of our options to strengthen laws further to protect Australia. We've introduced a new bill to make strong laws stronger, a bill that the opposition voted against yesterday in the House of Representatives for all their tough talk. And we will work through the High Court's written reasons when they are handed down in a few minutes' time. Contrast this with the actions of some of those who sit in this chamber, because we see the opposition regularly say one thing and do another. The Leader of the Opposition talks tough on borders, but he slashed funding for compliance staff when he was the Minister for Home Affairs. Mr Dutton talks tough on crime, but under his watch, sexual exploitation of migrants and organised crime people trafficking skyrocketed. When we need leaders to protect people, Mr Dutton plays politics. This government sees the challenges Order. in the world and is upfront with, them about, with Australians about them. We don't play politics with national security or social cohesion, and nor should the opposition. We won't repeat the mistakes made by the coalition in the past. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. Yesterday, the Senate heard that for years Mr Dutton and his coalition colleagues talked tough on national security but didn't deliver while in government. Why is it important to take strong action to keep the community safe and not just talk tough on national security? Uh, thank you. Just a moment again, Minister. Order on my left. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And again, President, we see lots of talk, lots of chat, lots of yelling from the opposition on matters of national security, but the one thing that's missing is action. Because as Home Affairs Minister, Mr Dutton spent years telling us he'd closed the back door to Australia, but now we find out that he left the front gate Order. wide open, swinging in the breeze. His search for political division does nothing to make people safer. Let's not forget the mess Mr Dutton left the Home Affairs portfolio in. A visa backlog of one million people, 
dodgy international education systems funnelling visa rorts every single day. Report after report found gaping holes Order in Mr Dutton's rorted visa system, which was letting criminals into the country, a visa system and that allowed Watt, foreign organised crime syndicates into the country. Uh, Senator Brown. I'm waiting for order before I call the minister again. Minister. Mr Dutton's record is a visa system that allowed foreign organised crime syndicates into the country. These included the Albanian mafia, who engaged in drug trafficking, money laundering, slavery and sexual exploitation. And what did he do in the wake of all these reports? He cut compliance officers by 50%. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. I'm sorry, Senator Walsh. Please resume your seat. I expect when the senator is on her feet, ready to ask her question, that there will be silence so that we can hear the question. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. We know tough talk isn't enough to keep Australians safe. Why is it important to ensure tough words are matched with tough actions? I'll just wait for silence. Order. Order. Order across the chamber. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Mr Dutton and his team have had a lot to say in the last couple of weeks about hardened criminals being released into the community, but it seems they don't apply the same standard to their own senators. I was surprised to see weekend reports that a Liberal senator urged the Albanese government to release a child sex offender from immigration detention in circumstances similar to those the coalition is now politicising. In a letter to the Immigration Minister, Senator Dean Order. Smith asked for a man Order. convicted of sex with a girl aged between 13 and 16 to be transferred from Christmas Island into the community. And what have we heard from Mr Dutton? Silence. Absolute silence. Contrast that with Mr Dutton's remarks in 2021 when confronted with a similar situation where he said, and I quote, why would a member of parliament defend anyone who has been convicted of pedophilia? For Mr Dutton, there is one standard for the government and a different standard for his own people. Utter hypocrisy. When it's one of his own calling on offenders to be released into the community, he has nothing to say. Uh, thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Patterson. Uh, I'm sorry, Senator Patterson. I have Senator Patterson on his feet, waiting to ask his question. There needs to be silence. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Watt. Media reporting today revealed an immigration detainee who refused a mandatory electronic tracker was uncontactable by police following their release in response to the High Court decision earlier this month. Will the minister confirm whether there is an individual who was released from immigration detention, currently residing in the community and uncontactable by our law enforcement agencies? Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Watt. Uh, well, Senator Patterson, the short answer is that we trust the Australian Federal Police to do their job. Uh, this matter has been referred to the Australian Federal Police and we trust them to do their job. Uh, our government is putting in place the strict measures we need to make sure that if one single individual violates their visa conditions, it's a criminal offence. And I might point out, uh, President, that only yesterday in the House of Representatives, our government tried to amend tough laws to make them tougher. And what did the opposition do? They voted against them. Just like they voted against cost of living relief, they Order. called for cost of living relief, they vote against it. They called for tough laws, uh, they vote against them. Minister. Senator, Senator Patterson. On direct relevance, Madam President, I'd be interested to know how the opposition's voting record alleged is relevant to the question I asked about uh, someone released order. in the community. Order. Order across the chamber. Order. Uh, Minister, I'll draw you back to Senator Patterson's question, but I will say, Senator Patterson, that the Minister uh, did answer your question in the first part when he first stood up. Please continue, Minister Watt. Well, as I say, I, referred, I did answer the question, Mr President, by saying that this matter is being investigated by the AFP uh, and we trust them to do their job. Now, Senator Patterson talks about the alleged voting record of the, of the opposition. It's a matter of record. It's in the Hansard that yesterday the opposition voted with the Greens against our attempt to make tough laws even tougher. The only thing that's been alleged in the last couple of weeks that hasn't been true is Senator Patterson's allegation that there was a terrorist attack on the US-Canada border. He's content to go out there and make up stuff 
in order to whip up anxiety into the, in the community, rather than actually working responsibly with the government to make our tough laws even tougher. Uh, thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Scar. Point of order. order. Just a moment, Senator Scar. Order. Senator Scar. Point of order, impugning motive. You talked about my colleague Senator Patterson whipping up, whipping up hysteria, etc., with that intent. That's clearly impugning Senator motive. Scar. Thank you, Minister Wong. Well, on the point of order, I think it's reasonable political comment to respond to a very senior shadow uh, making reference to something as, or talking about something as if it were a terrorist incident without being briefed, and when it was not. Uh, Senator Scar, I don't believe it was impugning the senator, but I will remind uh, the minister and all senators in this place to be mindful of the language that's used when responding or making statements. Minister Watt. Um, so again, to continue my answer, President, as the, ABA, the Border Force Commissioner said yesterday, the individual concerned has been referred to the Australian Federal Police, and this government does not comment on ongoing police matters. It would be highly irresponsible to do so. But Australians can be assured that all efforts are being made to track down this individual. So in the meantime, our government will continue to put in place tough measures that we need to make sure that if one single individual violates their visa conditions, as has Thank alleged you. to be the case at the moment, then that will be deemed to be a criminal offence. These individuals have been released under the strictest visa possible conditions, and they are being monitored by a joint border force AFP task force operation. And if you're saying clearly not, you're having a go at the federal police. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to support the federal uh, thank police you. in their Your job. Your time uh, has expired. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patterson, first supplement. Thank you, Madam President. When was this individual first released from immigration detention, and how long have they been out in the community without an electronic tracker? Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Watt. Well, of course, Senator Patterson, uh, the ability to uh, impose an ele electronic tracker, as you refer to it, was only possible after the legislation that was voted on uh, in this chamber uh, when we last sat. Uh, and I've made very clear that the, that the Australian Federal Police and Border Force are making every attempt possible uh, to locate this individual and ensure that they comply with the law. Uh, and I dare say that they would be subject uh, to criminal charges uh, once they are captured. That's obviously a matter for the federal police, but I dare say that they would be subject to those kind of criminal charges uh, for breaching uh, the visa conditions uh, that were imposed on that individual, and I think they will regret their actions in, the, in doing so. But what we're focused on is in ensuring that we do have a tough, correct response. Uh, we welcome the support that the opposition provided us when le legislation was passed here in the last chamber and I'm in last sitting week, and I'm very surprised that the opposition voted with the Greens yesterday to make those laws even tougher. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Minister. What Senator Patterson, second supplementary. Thank you. Legislation passed by the Parliament in the last sitting week established a regime where by high-risk individuals released from immigration detention are required to wear an electronic bracelet unless the minister is satisfied the individual does not pose a risk to the community. Does the minister agree that, by definition, the individual in question poses a risk to the community, given they refuse to wear an electronic tracker prior to going on the run? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Watt. Well, Senator Patterson, as I say, this government has legislated uh, in very quick time to make sure that Border Force and the AFP have the powers they need to monitor, uh, impose curfews on uh, and apply electronic bracelets to the people who have been released from detention as a result of a High Court order. Uh, in, again, I, re I repeat, that stands in great contrast uh, to the actions of your own Senator Smith, who called for a convicted pedophile to be released from community detention without any, without any monitoring, without any bracelets, without any actions whatsoever. We're actually trying to be responsible here and protect community safety while you're out there applying one standard uh, to the government and a completely different standard to your own people. When are you going to be consistent about this? If you're actually tough on these matters, then the same standard should apply to your own people rather than having letters written to immigration ministers asking for convicted pedophiles to be released into the community without any monitoring whatsoever. We stand by our record and stand by our uh, tough Thank laws. you, Minister. Senator Orman Payne. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education, Minister Watt. Only 1.3 per cent of public schools in this country are fully funded meaning teachers are burning out from being overworked and underpaid, 
while many students go without basic resources like textbooks, stationery and laptops. Teachers are increasingly having to pay personally for classroom materials, while out-of-pocket costs for parents and carers are ballooning. Results are declining, students are disengaged and many are unable to even attend school. Is the Labor government aware of the extent of the impact of the crisis of underfunding in public schools? Thank you, Senator Ormond Payne. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Ormond Payne. Obviously, this is a matter that you have asked questions about in the past, uh, and my answer remains uh, there is only one way that public schools in this country are going to get the funding they deserve, and that is through the election of a Labor government. Um, what we saw over 10 years, what we saw over 10 years, uh, was cuts to public fu public education funding, Order. And, Order. and we have made very firm our commitment to deliver public schools with the funding that they Minister need. Minister Watt, Minister Watt, the please resume your seat. Order across the chamber. Order. Order, Senator Mackenzie. You have had an awful lot to say. I invite you Tuesday night. Put your name down for adjournment. Minister Watt, please continue. Well, doesn't it say a lot about the coalition that when matters of fair funding for public education is raised, they laugh. They laugh. Every single one of them Order. thinks it's a laughing matter uh, that public education doesn't receive the funding that they deserve. Now, I know that many, many Australians make a choice uh, that they prefer to have a non-government school education for their children, whether because of their religious beliefs or for other reasons. And we will support those parents' rights and those families' rights to choose that. But what we will also do, unlike what we saw from the coalition, is ensure that public schools have the funding they deserve to deliver the high-quality education that I have chosen for my children, that I went through in my own education, and that my family members have taught in the public education system. So please don't come and give me a lecture about public education when you are in a party that can never deliver a single cent of extra funding for public education. You can sit in the corner and throw rocks at other people, but it will only be a Labor government that delivers public education funding, and that is exactly what we are on track to do. Ms Minister Clare has made very clear that Commonwealth funding will continue to grow during the one-year extension of the current National School Reform Agreement, uh, and for public schools this in includes an increase from $10.6 billion to, in 2023 to $11.1 billion in 2024. And we remain committed to working with states and territories to get every school, public and non-state, uh, to get 100 per cent of its fair funding level in the future. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Ormond Payne, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Considering that evidence today shows that poorer kids are up to five years behind their richest peers in NAPLAN, does the Labor government believe that immediate action must be taken to stop this inequality being permanently baked into the system? Thank you, Senator Ormond Payne. Minister Watt. Um, Senator Ormond Payne, yes, as I've made repeatedly clear. The Albanese government and any Labor government believes that public education needs its fair share of funding. We recognise the right of families to choose other forms of education for their children and we will support those choices as well. But we do acknowledge that public education has been grossly underfunded under 10 years of coalition government and we intend to reverse that. And that is exactly why we entered a one-year extension of the current National School Reform Agreement, uh, a school reform agreement which under the coalition saw public funding levels fall for public education uh, under us in just our one-year agreement. Uh, the public that education funding is going to increase from $27.3 billion to $28.6 billion, uh, including an increase of half a billion dollars for public schools alone. In the meantime, we are obviously in the process of negotiating a national school reform agreement with the states and territories, and we've made very clear that we're committed to ensuring that every school, public and non-public, receives 100 per cent of its fair funding level. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Ormond Payne, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. I'm not sure that the minister actually accepts the scale and urgency of the crisis, but noting that it would only cost $6 billion to close the funding gap for our public schools, which is a third of what the federal government spends every year on private schools, how can the Albanese government justify not taking immediate action on the underfunding crisis? Yeah. 
Thank you, Senator Orman. Payne, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Well, it wouldn't be question time in the Senate without a Green senator patronising everyone and telling us that we don't understand something, uh, because that is a daily occurrence uh, here. Senator last Watt. week, last week it was Senator Sen Stubridge patronising us, saying we wouldn't minister understand Watt. how the law works. Here comes the chief patroniser. Order, order, order. Senator Wish Wilson. Point of, President, point of order. Senator oh, McKim. I'm sorry, Senator McKim. Thank you, uh, President. That was clearly a personal reflection uh, on Senator Orman Payne. It was false, as well uh, as being contrary you, to standing orders. It does be not withdrawn. need commentary. Uh, you may have noticed I was trying to call order, and I was going to ask the minister to withdraw and to remind the minister to make his comments to the chair. Minister. Uh, I withdraw, and I will, I will ensure that I make all parliamentary and unparliamentary remarks through you, President, uh, in um, future. But I withdraw. I withdraw. Minister Watt, that was um, Minister Watt. Minister Watt. Order. Order. Minister Watt, I didn't find that funny, and I would expect all senators in this place not to make unparliamentary remarks. Thank you, Minister. President. Thank you, President. Um, well, Senator Portman Payne, I can assure you that I do understand uh, the need through the chair. I, uh, President, I, I can assure you, President, that I do understand Senator Orman Payne's point. And as I say, I don't need to take lectures from a Green senator about public education, having been educated there myself, in educating my kids themselves, and with Order. almost my entire family Order. being teachers in the public education system. Order. But feel free to come in and give us a lecture any time, because, because the Greens are good at le giving lectures. What they are not good at is delivering anything for the Australian public. It is only a Labor government that is going to be delivering public education funding. Thank God we have a Labor government now to deliver the public education funding that we need, because we know it would never have happened under the coalition, and we know that all schools wouldn't get the support that they need uh, from a thank coalition you, government. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Order. Order. I will remind all senators in this place the standing orders provide for a, minister, a senator to stand and make a point of order, particularly about unparliamentary behaviour. That means all senators need to also question their own behaviour. It is not OK to interject and wildly point at the minister. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Can the minister update the Senate on the actions the Australian government is taking to uphold rules and norms in our region, including the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea? Minister. Thank you, President, and thanks to Senator Smith, who understands the importance of international law to shaping a peaceful, stable and prosperous region for our people and for our nation. The observation of rules and norms in the region is what supports peace, security and stability. And Australia's support uh, for international law is why we strongly support the 2016 South China Sea Arbitral Award, which is final and binding on the parties. And our continued support for international law and the Arbitral Award is also why the Deputy Prime Minister announced last week that Australia would conduct the inaugural Philippines-Australia Maritime Cooperative Activity. As this activity was the first, this activity was the first joint sale between the Australian and Philippines Armed Forces in the West Philippine Sea. The maritime cooperative activity included Philippine Navy vessels BRP Gregorio del Pilar and BRP Davao del Sur, Royal Australian Navy frigate HMAS Toowoomba, five Philippine Air Force surveillance aircraft and an RAAF, RAAF P-8A maritime surveillance aircraft. Our joint activity demonstrates our shared commitment to exercising freedom of navigation and overflight consistent with international law in support of a peaceful, stable and secure Indo-Pacific. And we will continue to operate closely with our friends in the region, such as the Philippines, to advocate for the importance of international law. We're putting in the work, we're engaging with our partners, repairing our international relationships. Uh, and acting accordingly. Unlike Mr Dutton, we are not just talking tough and leaving a vacuum for others to fill, uh, as we saw uh, in the Pacific in the period of the Morrison government. Uh, so, uh, I have often spoken in the visits that I have made uh, to uh, Southeast Asia and, to, and beyond of the importance of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It is a Thank vital you, national the interest for, for Australia. Has expired. 
Senator Marielle Smith, first supplementary. I note Australia's upgrade of our relationship with the Philippines to a strategic partnership following the Prime Minister's visit to Manila earlier this year, the first bilateral visit by an Australian Prime Minister in 20 years. Can the Minister update the Senate on what practical steps we are taking to enhance our cooperation with the Philippines? Minister Wong. Thank you. Thank you, President. Well, we are a government that is working to deepen uh, the, Australia's relationship with the Philippines. And the Prime Minister visited the Philippines in September this year to meet with President Marcos. Uh, and I had the honour of visiting the Philippines to meet Sec Secretary Manalo, one of several meetings we've had this year, including a two plus two with uh, Minister Farrell in Adelaide. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister has had productive meetings with his counterpart, Secretary Teodoro. And one of the key outcomes of the Prime Minister's visit was the upgrade of our relationship to a strategic partnership, and a key tenet of that partnership is to deepen our strong maritime cooperation. This cooperation recognises that the Philippines is central to maintaining peace and stability in our region. Uh, for all of their tough talk, the Liberals had nine years, three Prime Ministers, and they couldn't manage one standalone visit to the Philippines. Senator Mariel Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Can you update the Senate on the steps the Albanese government is taking more broadly to secure our home, including through the AUKUS agreement and the Defence Strategic Review? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Well, the government has been working to repair our international relationships uh, in order to make us stronger and more influential in the world. Uh, and we've done so consistently, we've done so calmly, and we've done so without compromising on what is important to Australians. That is why we are working to progress AUKUS, the agreement with our partners in the United States and the United Kingdom. That is why we are in implementing the Defence Strategic Review. That's why we are working so hard to have uh, open dialogue and close engagement with our friends and partners. Australia wants to contribute to a strategic balance, and that is what we are doing, because it is that strategic balance which underpins the stability and prosperity and peace that all of us seek. What we have, unfortunately, from Mr Dutton is the same failed old playbook. For nine long years, those opposite were more interested in gaining attention than getting outcomes, despite the fact they themselves proved that shouting about national security did nothing to make Australia more secure. Thank you, Minister. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Foreign Minister, Minister uh, Senator Wong. In October at the UN General Assembly First Committee, Australia abstained on a resolution on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. Instead of voting yes, Australia voted no due to an apparent concern with the line, it is in the interests of the very survival of humanity that nuclear weapons never be used again under any circumstances. 136 nations voted in favour of this resolution, which also notes that the only way to guarantee that nuclear weapons will never be used again is their total elimination. If the government is as strongly committed to nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament as it claims, why did it vote against this resolution? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Well, first, can I make a point about uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons? Uh, and I know that those who advocate for the TPNW uh, uh, and Senator Pocock did so in that question uh, uh, construe the argument as if that is the only way one can demonstrate uh, a commitment uh, to nuclear disarmament. We disagree. We, we believe that uh, the cornerstone of the nuclear non-proliferation disarmament, re disarmament regime is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I would make the point uh, we already as a country have made a very clear commitment uh, internationally that we will we do not have and will not seek nuclear weapons. We have legally binding commitments not to acquire, possess or have control over nuclear weapons under both the Non-Proliferation Treaty of Nuclear Weapons and the Treaty of Rarotonga. Uh, and there's no question that we recognise the devastating consequences for humanity of any use of nuclear weapons. Uh, what we do say is we need to work with others to strengthen the NPT. 
uh, we need to join with others, as we have, uh, for a fissile material cut-off treaty, and we need to work with the IEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, to ensure the peaceful use of technology to combat proliferation and nuclear security risks. Uh, we, the government shares the TPNW's ambition for a world without nuclear weapons. We are committed to engage constructively to identify possible pathways to disarmament. And the senator will know that under this government we have determined to attend the two meetings of state parties under the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons as an observer. Uh, we have chosen to abstain rather than vote against the UN General Assembly resolution, which I think is the reference he made, uh, unlike the previous government. And we will continue to engage both with the UN process and with civil society and take a considered approach to the treaty. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. I think there were many Australians who were puzzled by the abstention, and I'm, under I'm interested in what circumstances would the government consider the use of nuclear weapons and ensuing humanitarian consequences acceptable? Uh, thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Wong. I think we all understand uh, the horror of the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and the way you posit that question, Senator Poker, suggests that that is the basis on which uh, we uh, uh, made the decision we made. I've explained to you the framework that we are operating under. Uh, I, with, I think it is problematic uh, that people choose not to uh, put impetus behind the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That is the treaty that has uh, the nuclear parties as part of it, uh, and we all know Order. Uh, that nuclear um, um, armed states must be part of any nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament regime. Now, uh, I understand uh, why uh, there are advocates, including from civil society, who want the TPNW. Uh, well, yeah, we, we, we all share uh, that aspiration, uh, but uh, we also know uh, that there has to be verification, uh, there has to be um, uh, thank you, Minister. The time for responding has expired. Senator David Pocock, second supplementary. President, and thank you, Minister. I, I note that Japan supported that motion, and I'm interested, given Labor has committed and indeed recommitted to signing and ratifying the TPNW, when will it actually follow through with this? Minister Wong. Uh, what we have said is we will consider the treaty, including questions about its universal universality its interaction with the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the need to ensure an effective verification and enforcement architecture. Now, they are reasonable propositions if you actually want a world free of nuclear weapons, if you actually want a world where we make progress towards disarmament. Uh, you have to have an approach, you have to have universality, you have to have an eye to the NPT, which is the only treaty uh, to which the nuclear parties are party, and we have to have a verification and enforcement architecture. I mean, that's the, that, that is the logic of making sure you have dis progress on disarmament. You have to have verification and enforcement. Uh, now that's a reasonable position. I understand uh, that, you know, that the, the concern people have, uh, and I, I would point you to the work that the government is doing, uh, whether it's on the NPT, uh, our attendance at the TPA, Treaty for Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons Thank you, Minister. Conferences, the time for answering uh, the expired. Senator Van. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the men, uh, Senator representing uh, the Minister for Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Can the Minister for Industrial Relations comment on the concerns raised by BHP in their submission regarding the same job, same pay policy, particularly in relation to the estimated $1.3 billion annual financial impact on their operations and the potential broader economic consequences including inflation and productivity. Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Van. Uh, I certainly have seen the media reports uh, of BHP's claims as to the extra costs that they would incur uh, under the government's legislation, um, but I make absolutely no apologies for us uh, a Labor government seeking to close the types of loopholes that large multinational corporations like BHP, like Qantas uh, and a number of others have exploited, which have resulted in the pay and conditions of their workers being undermined. Um, and 
One of the reasons I feel very confident in, doing, in saying so, Senator Van, is that I have met personally uh, labour hire workers engaged at BHP's mines uh, in central Queensland who have talked to me about the fact that they are paid significantly lower wages with worse conditions uh, than the BHP permanent employees they work alongside. Uh, what has actually happened here is that, and, and BHP has taken it one step further by effectively setting up an in-house labour hire firm, which again the employees of that labour hire firm, which is, which is the parent company of which is BHP, are paid lower rates and conditions than the full-time BHP workers. Uh, that they work alongside. So I've met these people. I've talked to them about the fact that they can't afford um, to, you know, the same things for their families as the permanent employees they work alongside. And I think it is wrong, and the, Labor, the Albanese government thinks that it's wrong, that a large company can enter an enterprise bargaining agreement with its workforce, negotiated with the union, which is what BHP and others have done, and then get around that enterprise agreement by forming an in-house labour hire company or bringing in labour hire from outside, paid on lower rates and conditions, then that company has itself negotiated. That is wrong, that is un-Australian, and we want to crack down on it. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Van, first supplementary. Thank you. Could the minister provide insight into how the government plans to address the fears of significant job losses and the reduction in competitiveness in the mining sector, as highlighted by BHP due to the financial implications of the same job, same pay policy. Thank you, Senator Van, Minister. Um, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Van. And I'd be obviously very happy to, to introduce you to some of those miners who I've, I've spoken to, Senator Van, and to take you through um, what's happening in Queensland coalfields and no doubt the Hunter Valley and other places as well. Um, but the, uh, I, I may not have the most up to date information on this, but I certainly remember when we had Senate estimates recently, and I was briefed ahead of that. Uh, my understanding is that BHP have not provided any of the evidence to back up their claims as to what the extra costs on them would be. They have certainly provided information to the media, which has run their stories, uh, about the so-called extra costs that BHP will incur. But the other point here is that often the claim is made by these companies and members of the opposition that this is a cost to the economy to try to fix this up. It's actually what it's about is where the money goes, and what we're saying is the money should go to the workers who produce BHP's profits, not being an, ending up in bigger profits for BHP and its shareholders. Fair's fair, workers should get a fair deal. Thank as you, well. Minister. What, Senator Van? Second supplementary. Thank you, and thank you, Minister. But I, I would guarantee I've met more miners than you have in your lifetime. <laughs> order, order. In the light of order, order. Order. <laughs> in light of the I think we're order. Uh, we need to start the clock again, and we're wasting time here because I have called people to order, and you continue to be disorderly, Minister uh, Senator Van. Please start the question again. Thank you for the promotion. In light of the concerns about increased labour costs and economic uncertainty, can the minister explain the rationale behind the same job, same pay policies approach, con especially considering Australia's position? as a major mining nation with already high labour costs. Thank you. Senator Van, Minister Watt. Um, thank you, Senator Van. And I have to say I didn't see you at the, uh, the Mining and Energy Union Queensland branch 115-year anniversary dinner the other night in Brisbane, but maybe you were there up the back. Uh, it was a very good night. I'm sure you will agree if you were there. Um, but thank you. In, on a serious note, Senator Van, the rationale for this is, as I have explained, um, that we don't believe and I don't think most Australians believe that a company uh, should have the right to enter an enterprise agreement with its workers, negotiated with the union to pay certain rates and conditions, and then be allowed under the law to then either bring in labour hire workers who are employed by another entity on lower wages and conditions, or to set up their own in-house labour hire firm, which is what BHP have done. That does sound like a loophole, Senator McAllister, and it's a loophole that is resulting in workers who work really hard in really difficult conditions uh, getting ripped off uh, to back up the profits of large corporations. We obviously support profitable corporations, but we don't think that their workers should be exploited, and that's Thank what's you, going Minister. on right now. The time for answering has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. Last night I had the privilege to go and see the Australian industry, Defence Network, Sovereign 
Capability Showcase. This event is a great opportunity for industry companies to show Parliament why Australian defence technology capabilities, capabilities are world leading. The Australian Bushmaster is world famous, but there's so much more going on. From drones all the way up to Hawkeyes, we make all kinds of kit used by ADF here and overseas. I spoke to the vendors there and stall after stall I got the same message, that the Australian government is making it harder and harder for them to sell what they make. And why would that be, I asked. Well, the government prefers to buy foreign-owned manufacturers. Minister, why is the Australian government making it harder for Australian defence companies to sell to the Australian government? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister, oh, I, sorry, Minister Wong. Um, th thank you, Senator Lambie, and, uh, and you are right. Uh, we do need a sovereign capability in this country. Uh, and the decisions we have to make uh, is in which areas we have um, uh, that sovereign capability. And uh, I regret that we've seen uh, nine years of a lot of announcements under the previous government. Uh, uh, very little, very, very, very little capability actually Order. delivered. Uh, we remember there were two, two submarine plans um, that were uh, junked over the nine-year period. I'm sorry. Order. Well, are you a lib now? Hard to tell sometimes. Hard to tell sometimes. Uh, Senator Wong, Senator really? Wong, I Very am going to draw to you to Senator Lambie's question. He's gone quiet now, hasn't he? Minister Wong, I am going to draw you to Senator Lambie's question. Order. 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 They voted with you, actually. Would you like me to sit down or do you want yes, me to continue? Please. Which Order across. Uh, if you just take your seat for a moment. As I've said on previous occasions, this, the crossbench are entitled to have their questions asked in silence and to be responded to without interjection from other senators. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the Defence Strategic Review uh, goes to many of the capability challenges which are long lived that we are working on. Uh, and the government is also developing the defence industry development strategy in line with the election uh, commitment. Uh, 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 Minister Conroy uh, gave a speech today to the National Press Club um, uh, in which he spoke uh, at length, obviously, about AUKUS, but also about uh, the Australian build of uh, the SSN AUKUS uh, and, more broadly, uh, about the importance of Australia's sovereign capabilities. So I understand, Senator Lambie, uh, as someone from South Australia, there has been a lot of uh, different decisions made by past governments. Uh, there was a defence strategic review, and I appreciate that parts of industry may not have liked or uh, some parts of that might have welcomed other parts. Uh, uh, and uh, I know uh, firsthand uh, uh, about the effect on the Australian Submarine Corporation of the various decisions the previous government made and the comments that were made in this chamber by uh, a, a coalition defence minister that those uh, men and women couldn't build a canoe. But we, we, do, we do have faith uh, in, the, in Australia's industry Thank you, capacity the time to for contribute to our expired. cabinet. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. A number of Australian businesses last night told me that they have set up shop in the US and in the UK and other countries. They advised me that their success overseas is not recognised here and that even they, even though they have products that are fit for purpose, cost, effectively, cost effective and generally excellent, they are all considered too risky by the Department of Defence. Minister, why are Australian companies being forced offshore to succeed? Minister Wong. Well, I might pick up the last, the second to last point, uh, because I think that probably goes to the nub of the question, Senator Lambie, and that goes to risk. And obviously, uh, we are not a, an economy nor a military the size of the, the U.S. Uh, military or the U.S. Uh, nor do we have an industrial base uh, uh, of the the scale that the United States has. What we can do uh, is what we do well, uh, and we can focus on those uh, things. Uh, that we can do well and that we must do well, those areas where you have to have a sovereign capability onshore. And that's, that is what the government is doing. So I don't know, you know what, what, the, um, uh, what technologies uh, you were referring to when, when those uh, companies uh, make an assessment that they've had to go offshore because the Department of Defence considers it too risky. They obviously, the DOD has to make a decision. Defence has to make a decision, as you know. 
Uh, we, we put a lot of money, uh, funds, as we should, into defence capability, and defence has to make a judgment about which technology you, it's the going to make sure is, is the... Senator um, Lambie, second supplementary. Thank you. Um, Minister, another message I heard, and this doesn't surprise me, from the Australian businesses up there last night was that once AUKUS was announced, the money dried up. This appears especially true of those selling to the Army. The few items that they were selling were suddenly not required. Tenders were cancelled. Suppliers were left high and dry. Our own Australian suppliers, often after huge amounts of money, have been spent on research and development. Minister, why can't this government see that by blocking innovation in the Australian defence industry, it is weakening our sovereign capabilities and making us less secure? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Wong. Uh, thank, thank you, Senator Lambie. I, I can understand why uh, there might be companies who will be disappointed with the government's determination and decision to make sure that the very substantial uh, resource allocation is focused on the things that the DSR, the Defence Strategic Review, as, uh, outlines as a, Australia really needing. And I appreciate that there will be private sector firms who have a different view to that. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, um, the, the authors of, of the DSR um, uh, Sir Angus uh, and Mr Smith uh, made very clear uh, their, their assessment uh, of what was required, uh, of which capability needed to be focused on, and that did require some hard decisions. Uh, those hard decisions in relation to some capability is made in the context of increasing uh, allocation to other capabilities, including submarines, for the strategic reasons that the Deputy Prime Minister has outlined. Thank you, Minister Wong. Senator Pratt. Thank you, President. My question this afternoon is for the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Women's economic equality is central to achieving gender equality. Gender equality at work is an important aspect of this, and today the Workplace Gender Equality Agency revealed that the gender pay gap has reduced by over 1 per cent, the biggest reduction in the gender pay gap in eight years. So can the minister please update the Senate on the latest gender pay gap figures and the work the government is doing to advance women's economic equality and close the gender pay gap? Thank you, Senator uh, Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Pratt uh, for the question and for the work that she's done over many years in um, addressing and seeking gender equality in Australia. The Workplace Gender Equality Agency released its 22-23 gender equality scorecard today, and the scorecard confirms that the gender pay gap, as calculated by WGIA, has dropped 1.1 per cent to 21.7 per cent. And can I put on the record my thanks for the hardworking staff at WGIA? I had the opportunity to meet with them last week uh, in person, and for those those staff that work outside the uh, Sydney office uh, online, um, and I know they'd all been working incredibly hard uh, to get this uh, gender equality scorecard finalised and ready for release. The results of the scorecard is a great result, the biggest reduction since 2015, and it comes after the WGA gender pay gap had stagnated over the last two years. That 1.1 per cent reduction might, might, might sound abstract, but it's the equivalent to narrowing the gap by $1,322 a year. However, there is much more work to do, with the gap the equivalent of $26,393 a year remains. These results in the scorecard are from the largest ever employer census, covering 4.82 million employees. And the gap is calculated on total remuneration and on a full-time equivalent basis, which gives us a full picture of how men and women are faring in the workplace. WGIA is doing important work to help identify the drivers of the gap and where we need to focus our effort to close it. And the data collected by WGIA is an invaluable resource and a critical evidence base. The data shows there are a range of issues that drive the gender pay gap, as well as what is helping to close it. It helps us at an, at an economy and sector-wide level, but it also helps industries and individual employers understand where Thank their you, challenges Minister. lie. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. Thank you, President. The minister mentioned that the Workplace Gender Equality Agency scorecard has presented a range of issues relevant to closing the gender pay gap and supporting women's economic equality. So can the minister please tell us more about those findings and any work the government is doing in these areas? 
Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the, uh, for the supplementary. And um, as uh, everyone in this place knows, uh, we will be reporting at an employer level on the gender pay gap next year, uh, with those results available early next year. And that will shine a real light on the gender pay gap and provide some transparency for employees as well uh, and other employers. Uh, but in terms of what driving the gender pay gap, increased numbers of women or the closure of it, um, women in management positions is helping to close it, workforce composition, flexibility to manage work and care and women's representation in leadership and senior roles underpin efforts to close the gender pay gap, but progress is still too slow. Um, I think if we keep um, we have to keep working to address it. Some of our initiatives are domestic violence, leave entitlements, gender targets in our skills guarantee, supporting pay increases in feminised aged care sectors are all connected efforts to go to closing the gender pay gap, valuing women's work and supporting you, women's Minister. economic Senator equality. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. President, so we can see that closing the gender pay gap is just one of the things that needs to happen in order for us to achieve women's economic equality. So can the minister outline the government's work to advance gender equality and how the government is working for women and working to make Australia a more equal country? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank uh, Senator Pratt for that second supplementary. We can't separate economic equality for women from the rest of their lives, from caring responsibilities, their right to live free from violence. And this is a government that understands these connections and understands that all the systems need to work for women if we are going to shift the dial on gender equality. As a government, we are coming at this from every angle. In the last budget, we made, in the last two budgets, we've made the biggest investment in gender equality that we've seen for some time. We've modernised and expanded PPL, we've made childcare cheaper, we've expanded parenting payments single, and we've abolished Parents Next. We've put a gender lens on our workplace relations system and supported pay rises for the lowest paid. We've invested a record $2.3 in women's safety, reformed the family law system, legislated paid domestic and family violence leave and invested in housing for women escaping violence. There is much more work to do and our national strategy on gender equality you, will be released time next for year. Has expired. Senator Henderson. I thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Watt. Last week, many school students skipped class to attend school strike for Palestine protests, which Jewish community leaders warned would fuel division and anti-Semitism. As predicted by Jewish community leaders, anti-Semitic signs and slogans were ultimately displayed at these protests. Minister, what action did the Albanese government take prior to these protests to discourage attendance and encourage children to remain in school. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, well, I actually saw Minister Clare deal with this matter in, I think it was in question time in the House of Representatives, where he made very clear that his expectation as the Minister for Education uh, is that students should be at school during school hours. Um, so he did that in probably the most public forum we, we have in this country. Um, ultimately, decisions about the operation of schools are matters for state and territory governments and the non-government school sector, uh, but the minister's position on this was utterly clear. Um, and, you know, it, more broadly, uh, what, what we have also said is that we think it's important uh, that all of these matters be put uh, in a non-partisan, non-inflammatory manner. Um, and I'd encourage all senators in approaching and discussing these issues to recognise that there are members uh, on all, in all parts of our community who are extremely upset about the events that are going on at the moment. Of course, uh, we, we recognise that the Jewish community is going through great pain in our, in our community at the moment as a re result of the events uh, in the Middle East, and equally, uh, members of our Islamic communities are going through great pain as well. So I'd encourage all senators again uh, to consider that in terms of their public contributions on this topic. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Henderson, first supplementary. Minister, with reports of anti-Semitism rising across the world and tragically also in Australia, what steps is the Albanese government taking to actively counter anti-Semitic material which targets young people and school students? Thank you, Senator Henderson. Minister Watt. 
Um, thank you, President. And Senator Henderson, again, I would make the point that unfortunately we are seeing anti-Semitism on the rise in our community and right across the world at the moment, as we are also seeing Islamophobia uh, on increasing and on the rise across the community. And I think it is important uh, that all Australian politicians recognise that both of these things are occurring, that both are wrong, uh, and that both need to be condemned. Anti-Semitism needs to be condemned in the strongest possible terms, as does Islamophobia. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Henson. Of order on direct relevance, I asked about what steps the Albanese government is taking to actively counter anti-Semitic material which targets young people and school students. If the minister could address that question, please. Uh, I will remind the minister of your question, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And, and that's precisely why I was making the point that we need to recognise that uh, anti-Semitism is abhorrent Anti and Islamophobia is abhorrent in our communities and both need to be condemned. Uh, that's why the Australian government has developed Order. a social cohesion package to support Australian communities affected by the ongoing conflict, including a $25 million grant to the Executive Council of Australian Jewellery and $25 million to the Australian Palestinian Muslim and Thank other communities. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Henderson, second supplementary. The Australian Education Union in Victoria encouraged attendance by teachers and students at these protests, while the New South Wales Teachers Federation is encouraging teachers to bring action into classrooms. Does the Albanese government condemn this union activism, which is only serving to promote division in Australia? Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. Minister Watt. Uh, well, I've already pointed out the minister's answer, which was that, in his view, all, all school children should be at school. Um, Minister. I ask that I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you.